Hi, I'm Chrissy O'Malley, and this is Better Science Teaching. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to write an annotated bibliography after you've thought a little bit about what you want your science fair project to be and how you're going to find sources to use uh, is in starting your literature search. One of the reasons to do this is that it exposes you to some really great research. Um, by looking but for primary sources and peer-reviewed journals, you're going to get a little bit more access to the insights of real scientists and how that they do things. And you're going to understand how to organize this stuff a little bit better. So even if you don't like science fair and you're just doing this because you have to, um, you'll learn some things that will help you in other courses. And so, you know, if, if literature is your thing, you're going to learn something that helps you there. So I'm going to show you some things on my computer. Um, but we're going to start with first, it's a great idea to have done a little bit of brainstorming before doing this portion of your project, um, because that's going to help set you up for a little bit more success. One of the things that that lets you do is it helps you identify what you want your project to be. Remember, we want a project that's interesting to you, that's kind of new, uh, that has a new twist to it. Uh, if you don't know what your new twist is, you might be able to find it by doing some literature search. And you want it to be something that's actually possible. If you go to your science fair with a time travel project, it's pro probably not feasible. So you probably don't want to spend too much time going down a path where you're not going to end up with a, a submittable project at the end. So those are, those are our goals. Uh, hopefully with your brainstorming that you've already done, I have another video on that, I'll put it in the, I have a video about brainstorming. So if you haven't done that yet, I'll post a link so that you can see where, so that you can get some strategies for brainstorming. Um, but you'll probably generate some keywords that you can use. And when you search with keywords, you want to make sure a couple of things. You want to make sure that you are um, thinking about keywords in terms of phrases. Just a single word, is, it may not get you to the kind of ideas that you want. You want to use phrases, and you can use a couple other tricks too. One would be um, Boolean operators, which is using things like and, or, or nor. Um, you can also use asterisks to um, narrow that in a little bit. So for instance, I like to use Google Scholar to, to work in. It's just what I find most convenient. You can also use PubMed, you can use WorldCat, you can use interli interlibrary loans if you have access to a local university, those are pretty cool. Um, but there are, uh, Google Scholar is honestly the easiest one to use from home. PubMed's also from home and I think WorldCat is too. Um, but you know, we're in a time when it's a little bit healthier for us to avoid some risk and to stay home. So um, using your laptop is fine. Um, so I'm going to go to Google Scholar and I'm going to find it just by typing Google Scholar in my search bar. All right, now that I'm in Google Scholar, what I'm going to do is type in a search term. So what I studied when I was a student, a graduate student, was crinoid biomarkers. Um, so one thing that you can do is just type in crinoids. Um, if you just type in crinoids, that limits you because there's other versions of that word that you may want to find. You may want to find crinoidia, which is the class name for crinoids, or you may want to find um, just crinoid, and that would limit you. So you can make this a little bit wider by instead of including all the letters, just leave the ones on the end off uh, and just put crinoid and then asterisk, and that helps you out. And I studied biomarkers, so I'm going to use a Boolean operator. I'm going to use and biomarkers. See what we find. All right, so that brings up a bunch of things. <laughs> Surprise, it's stuff that I wrote. Sorry, I'm just not being shameful about this anymore. Okay, so um, I've got a bunch of things here. And what's really cool about Google Scholar is that you can use this as a jumping off point. So a couple things. Um, make sure I don't miss anything for you guys. So I'm going to use this to start an annotated bibliography. So I found a few things that I may want to read. You always kind of want to choose a few more than you actually have to deal with. If you have an assignment and you're given a minimum number, you kind of want to go a little bit over that because some of them, once you read them, they might not be good. So um, what I need to do for my annotated bibliography is uh, my teacher has assigned this an APA and your teacher may give you an assignment for what kind of citation to use. I know when I was in high school, we used MLA because that's what our, I think because that's what our English department wanted. But for ours, we use APA because that's what scientists usually use. And I don't really think that there's harm in students learning two different sources because um, as, a, as a science major, as soon as I hit my undergrad years, I had to learn EPA anyway. So 
you know, it, it's nice for kids who are interested in science to have exposure to that early. So I've got my crinoid stuff up here. And the thing is, if I click these little quotation marks that say cite, look at this guys, it brings up the citation in a whole bunch of formats. You got MLA and APA, which are very common. You have Chicago and Harvard and Vancouver. Um, I've only used MLA, APA. I've used APA for publications, and then a few journals have some very specific ones. But if I want to keep track of this, I can just go right in here. And the first part of my annotated bibliography is to include the citation at the top. It's kind of like a header. So if I select that and I copy it, I can go over to a Word document. Um, that's just how I'm comfortable doing it. However, if this is if this is for a science fair, this is how I did it for research. Um, but that gives it to you right there. Uh, but my students are using lab notebooks. This is a great way to take notes. So just go to whatever your next available page is. Write your citation across the top, and then you can write notes about that article right in this notebook. And so the nice thing about notebooks um, for this step for students is that it's really difficult to draw a figure in a Word document. It's nice for typing, but it's terrible for drawing a picture. And so that's one reason why students, I want you guys, if you're my student especially, I want you to use your notebook because it gives you space to draw, to draw some notes and stuff. It also puts, puts some stuff in your notebook so that you have some evidence of things that you're doing. Um, but you can just pull that right out of the Google citation. If you want to put it in a Word document, you can. I think that's a great idea um, because even if you are doing notes in your notebook, eventually you're going to need to write your literature review as a paper. And so if you're keeping track of these in a Word document, then it's already there. You don't have to transfer it from your notebook into your Word document because you've, you've been keeping track of those. Um, I'm going to go back to Google Scholar. All right, and I've got my citation, so I'm happy about that. So there's some cool things you can do here. One is it gives you links to PDFs. So this is a poster that I made. It's I have feelings about it now because it was my first undergrad poster. Um, but there it is. There's a poster. And so if you go to the things that say PDF, you'll be able to find stuff. Another thing that you can do with these is you can click on these things that say cited by nine and use those to find related articles. And so this is, um, this is from a book and I've got all these other things that were cited by it. And these are all other things about crinoids and there's one that's in Russian. Um, mm -hmm. and I can pull the PDFs for some of these, um, it's a geology article, Let's see what I can find. And so in some cases, I can actually get to PDFs of very closely related articles. And if you were just kind of, if you're just looking for the first time, this is a good way to get a few things to read as primary sources. Uh, if you decide that you want one of these that aren't available freely as a PDF, my recommendation is that you um, either talk to your teacher um, and ask them if they have any ways to be able to get access to it. I know that when I take courses with our local university, sometimes I temporarily have access to the libraries and that's nice. Um, or you can reach out directly to these scientists. And I know that I've done that for students who, I've done that for students who, who were a little bit nervous about doing that themselves. And every time um, those scientists have been happy to share their publications with my students. And so that's been great. You wanna make sure that with your notes that you're keeping track of, that you keep track of your citation across the top and then you you summarize that paper below. And what that summary can include is what was the purpose and the hypothesis of that experiment that the scientist is writing about? Um, what are the, what variables, controls, and constants did they use? What you're looking for here is some ideas for when you set up your own experiment, what are the things that you need to be paying attention to? Which ones of those are relative to the question that you have or that you may be using? Um, the papers also, if you read through them to the end, have suggestions for what the next step might be in that research. And that's a really good place to look for ideas because you might be able to get something that can take your project that you think you know, maybe has already been solved to something that might be a little bit more novel and interesting 
sort of to scientists more broadly. Um, you want to think too as you're doing this about connections between your articles. So what are the relationships between these things? Um, and I'm not talking about in terms of, you know, how are how are the scientists connected to each other? You know, like were they friends or were they were they enemies or were they you know was there a mentor and a student relationship? Like no one cares. Um, what you want to do is look at how those ideas are related to each other. And that's a that's a good thing to summarize when you're writing your literature review about your paper. So I hope that that's something that can help you. Um, use, use Google Scholar to search through things, try some stuff. Make sure that you spend a little bit of time on this because sometimes the first thing you click on isn't really the best article for you to read or really the best place for you to look at experimental design and conclusions and, and get good ideas. Um, I hope that that helped. I hope that that helps you get a little bit closer to having a great science fair project this year. Make sure that you subscribe so you don't miss any of our Science Fair Friday posts. And I hope that you stay safe and you be well. And I'll see you soon. Have a great day. Bye. So that's my camera. It's recording. It is recording. <laughs> can't jump around in here, it makes the camera jiggle. <laughs>